hi guys welcome back thank you so much for the support on my last video i had no idea what to expect i was expecting my friends and family to watch it and that's it and uh, a couple more people watched it than that thank you for sharing your stories I think you're really brave and I think you're really cool. 99% of the feedback I got was so nice. I cried reading a lot of those comments. And of course there's the 1% that were not so nice. I've replied to the people I need to, I blocked the people I needed to, and I just let some people talk to themselves. <laughs> there's some people writing novels in the comments. So, so I'm just gonna let them go because it helps with engagement. So, appreciate it. And I've been to enough therapy, so I'm good. We're good. There have been a few defining moments in my life that altered my brain chemistry forever. Finding out Santa wasn't real, watching my brother be born, Taylor Swift releasing Reputation, and losing my faith in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, aka the Mormon Church. You can watch my previous video about what the breaking point was for me, but the truth is my testimony had been crumbling for a long time up to that point. And now that I'm fully out, I am learning something new every day. And by that, I mean something terrible. Starting with Joseph Smith, who founded the church. I was taught growing up that he was an inspired prophet of God. He was persecuted for no reason. People were just big old meanies to him because he said that he had a vision and people were like, that's preposterous. I was way off. Turns out this guy sucked. 90% of what I talk about in this video, I didn't know my three decades of being in the church. And I was continuously told that anything negative I heard about Joseph Smith was just lies from Satan. But apparently Satan loves facts though, so shout out to him. So whether you believe he was a prophet or you've never heard of this man in your life, get cozy, grab a drink, cause you're gonna need it, and grab a throw up bowl while you're at it, just in case. When I started research for this, which has been in the work for weeks now, I was going to talk about Joseph Smith's entire life, starting from birth to Carthage, but uh, that video would be like five hours long. So I wanted to start with one of the more controversial and disgusting parts of his life, which was his practice of polygamy. Joseph had up to 40 wives that the church acknowledges. Wikipedia, however, names up to 50, and in my opinion, I think there were much more than that due to the secrecy of it all. There was nothing ethical about this. Everything was kept secret from both the public and his own church members. I'm talking about most of the wives not knowing each other existed, especially his first wife and only legal wife, Emma. He was marrying underage girls, women who were already married, all without her knowledge or consent, except like four of them, which I'll get into. I also think it's extremely important for members of the church to know these things, especially the women of the church. And if you were taught all of these things growing up in church, I will eat my shirt. So let's get into it. People like to say the LDS church is transparent because they have essays on their website about polygamy and the more controversial things about the church. But even those essays are lacking in detail and not telling the whole story. And some people still don't know that these essays exist. I have heard through the grapevine someone showed them to their mom and the mom told them the church website had been hacked. So <laughs> the denial runs deep. Okay, I'm skipping a lot here and I can't go into every detail, but I promise I will in a future video. But the year is 1825. Joseph Smith is 19 years old. He is in the employment of Josiah Stowell, who is using Joseph's services to locate a supposed dream mine of silver and gold, which was never found. Joseph claimed to have supernatural seeing powers and could locate buried treasure using a seer stone or a pretty rock. So him and his fellow treasure diggers were boarded up at Isaac Hale's home, located in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where he first meets Emma Hale, his future wife, at least the first one. Emma's father, Isaac, got the ick from Joseph bad. Joseph asked him several times for his blessing to marry his daughter, and Isaac said no. Isaac said, quote, he was a stranger and followed a business that I could not approve. Isaac thought that Joseph was pretending to be a seer and didn't want someone like that around his daughter, which, good for him. So what did the young couple do? They ran off and got eloped, and Isaac was not happy about this. A neighbor of Smith's named Peter said he walked in on a fight between Joseph and Isaac, his father-in-law, and Isaac was saying, you have stolen my daughter and married her. I had much rather followed her to the grave. You spend your time in digging for money, pretending to see in a stone, and thus try to deceive people. Peter said that Joseph cried, 
and acknowledged that he could not see in this stone and never could. He then promised to give up his old habits of digging for money and looking into the stones. This was corroborated by Joseph's brother Alva, who said that Joseph told him peeping was all nonsense and he intended to quit the business for good and labor for his livelihood. If my dad and brother both believed my husband was a scammer, I feel like that carries some weight and it should have been a red flag to Emma but she believed Joseph over them. And this is just the beginning of a really difficult and unhealthy marriage for her. So in January, 1827, Emma and Joseph were married. Later in that same year, September, Joseph would receive the golden plates. They are supposed ancient texts written by Native Americans that were buried in Hill Cumora, located in Manchester, New York. I'm skipping over a lot, but the reason he knew where the plates were because an angel had told him four years prior is what he said. So Emma was actually his first scribe in translating these plates. She explained that he kept the plates hidden under a cloth, but at one point she did put her hand under the cloth and could feel the metal and stuff, but she never got to see them. Emma said Joseph would put his seer stone in a hat. He would put his face in it and dictate the words that appeared on the stone. This is the same method and the same stone he used in his treasure digging ventures, which he was later found to be fraudulent in a court of law, but can't get into all that right now. So in June 1828, Joseph and Emma had their first son, Alvin, who sadly only lived a few short hours. Altogether, they would have 11 children, but six of them would die as babies. I can't imagine what that's like, and I'm sure it was really, really hard on them. So the Book of Mormon was published on March 26th, 1830, and the church was established shortly after on April 6th, 1830. And at the time, it was named the Church of Christ. Emma would be baptized into the church in June of that same year. And then just that next year in 1831, Joseph would begin stepping out on his wife. So here is a handy dandy chart that I found on all of the plural wives of Joseph Smith, at least the ones that we know about. And I want you to take a gander, not only at the ages of these girls and women he married, but how old they were when he first met them. Then I want you to look up the definition of grooming. Then I want you to grab that throw up bowl these girls were as young as five years old when they first met Joseph Smith. Now, I work at an elementary school, and I cannot fathom looking at a child and saying, yep, that's going to be my future spouse. Something that is more, I don't want to say well-known, but better known today than it was when I was growing up is that the youngest girl Joseph married was 14 years old, and he was 38 years old. Here's how the church tries to justify this. From their website, it says, The youngest wife was Helen Mar Kimball, daughter of Joseph's close friends Heber C. and Violet Murray Kimball, who was sealed to Joseph several months before her 15th birthday. Marriage at such an age, inappropriate by today's standards, was legal in that era, and some women married in their mid-teens. So they refused to call her 14 for some reason. And then they say it was cool because a lot of other people were doing it at the time. No, they weren't. According to the 1890 census, women on average were married at 20 and men were married at 24. So it was not common because people used their brains and said, that is a child. Although the revelation of polygamy would not be introduced by Joseph until 1842, according to their website, the church says that Joseph knew it was a commandment as far back as 1831. Why did they say this? A few reasons. Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner, that is a long name. Mary, at age 12 in 1831, said that, Smith told me about his great vision concerning me. He said I was the first woman God commanded him to take as a plural wife. In 1834, he was commanded to take me for a wife. In 1842, I went forward and was sealed to him. Brigham Young performed the sealing. For time and all eternity, I did just as Joseph told me to do. So 12, gross. And she actually married Adam Leitner in 1835, who was still her husband when she was sealed to Joseph Smith. So he married a woman who was already married and this would not be the last time that he would do that. Around 1833, when Joseph was 27, him and Emma had a live-in nanny named Fanny Alger. She was 16 years old. The church states that this was Joseph's first wife, but we have no record of them ever being married, any sealing being performed. This was actually added in 60 years after the fact. This was also a decade before temples were built and years before the sealing ordinance was ever introduced. Multiple sources claim that Emma 
caught them in the act in their barn and kicked Fanny out that night. One source we have for this affair is Oliver Cowdery, who was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon and a scribe of Joseph. So Oliver was called over that night to calm Emma down. I think Joseph expected him to be on his side, but instead Oliver called what happened, quote, a dirty, nasty, filthy affair. Joseph was pissed and later excommunicated Oliver for not taking back what he said. Oliver later gets rebaptized and dies a believing member of the church, and he never ever recanted what he said. As far as Fanny Alger goes, even though she was married to Joseph, she went on and married someone else and had nine kids with him. She also joined a different church, and not a whole lot else is known about her. When her brother asked her about Joseph Smith, and her relationship with him, she said, quote, that is a matter all of my own and I have nothing to communicate. So she never denied it, but she also never defended Joseph. In my opinion, this might speak to the trauma she went through at that time, the embarrassment it caused her and the regret she had about the whole thing. But let's get this straight, Fanny was a victim just like the rest of his wives. As far as Emma's actions go, I think she had every right to be angry, but I do think she kicked the wrong person out that night. It's not my place to judge a woman if she stays in her relationship when there are extramarital activities, but I think we can agree the rules were very different back then and it was much more difficult to get a divorce as a woman and it probably brought on a lot of shame as it still does today. I'm not saying she wanted a divorce, I'm just saying it probably wasn't even an option to her as they had kids together and she had to think about how she would support herself because women were encouraged to stay home and not work, but Joseph lying to her about other women would be a consistent pattern for them throughout their entire marriage. So because rumors of Joseph's adultery were pretty persistent, the church actually added this statement to the Doctrine and Covenants in 1835. Inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. So why can't I find this in my scriptures? Because they removed it in 1876. This revelation contradicted the future DNC 132 polygamy revelation. So they were like, we can't have both of those in here. Yoink. Something you can still find in your Book of Mormon though is Jacob 2.24 and verse 26. It says, Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, my brethren, hear me and hearken to the word of the Lord. For there shall not any man among you have, save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. You get one wife, it's the way the world works. God sure does change his mind a lot. What a goofy guy. So Joseph would publicly deny his polygamy practices up until the day he died. And the church continued lying for him after that. In fact, the first seven prophets of the LDS church were practicing polygamists. Did you know that? I did not know that. My knowledge of polygamy was that Brigham Young did it, and once it was illegal, everyone was cool and stopped doing it. But factions of the LDS church are still not compliant to this day. I'm sure you've heard of Warren Jeffs and Samuel Bateman who recently got arrested. Yeah, they're just doing what Joseph did. His first official plural wife, because Fanny doesn't count because that was an affair, was Louisa Beeman who met Joseph when she was 12 years old and then would marry him at 26 in 1841 without Emma's knowledge. And this marriage happened before her own baptism two years later, which I find odd. After Joseph died, she remarried as a plural wife of Brigham Young, and she was not the only plural wife of Joseph's to do so. How does that work? You just shove women from one prophet to the other like cattle. I thought this was celestial marriage for all eternity, not just for time. So I'm very confused on why and how that happened. I mean, I'm not confused. I know why it happened because Joseph made it up and Brigham Young made it up. But anyways, <laughs> Joseph's second plural wife was Zena Huntington, who he met at 15 and married her at the age of 20. She was living at the Smith's home at the time while she was sick. And when he first proposed to her, she turned him down because she was in love with somebody else. His name was Henry Jacobs, and they even asked Joseph to officiate their wedding ceremony. At first he agreed, but then Joseph did not show up because he is a baby. He was pissed. He said that he could not give 
her to another man when she was already given to him by the Lord. The Lord gave you to me. Bitch, shut up. So a few months after she was already married to Henry, Joseph proposed to her again, saying that an angel with a sword appeared to him and was going to destroy him if he did not comply with polygamy and that he would lose his life, which is like, okay, find another girl who actually wants you then leave her alone. So now the prophet of the restored church is telling women that reject him that by doing so, they are causing his very death. Nice. And he would continue with the story of an angel with a sword anytime another woman said no. Not coercive or threatening at all. So she finally agreed when she was seven months pregnant with Henry's child. And Henry was at their wedding. Zena said, quote, I made a greater sacrifice than to give my life, for I never anticipated again to be looked upon as an honorable woman by those I dearly loved. There's a reason the church does not talk about these women. It's because they were miserable. Her own husband, Henry, approved of the marriage, saying, quote, whatever the prophet did was right without making the wisdom of God's authorities bend to the reasoning of any man. Now, this is a damning quote to me because he is acknowledging that it didn't make any freaking sense, but because he was the prophet, he could do whatever he wanted. And this is the way members speak today. If the prophet says it, the conversation is over. Joseph also married Zena's sister, Presendia, a few months after marrying Zena. Uh, Presendia was 31, so more age appropriate, but still. Not the only two sisters he would end up marrying. And after Joseph's death, Zena went on to become a plural wife of Brigham Young. So if it's not clear by now, no one is off limits to this man, not even his own brother's widowed wife. After his brother died in 1841, he married his sister-in-law, Agnes, the next year. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Joseph even got real kinky with it, married a mother-daughter pair, Patty and Sylvia, just one month apart from each other. He also married the wife of of Apostle Orson Hyde while he was still alive, although it's not clear he knew about it because he was serving a mission for the church at the time in Jerusalem. We also have a first-hand account of two sisters marrying Joseph and neither of them knew about the other. Emily and Eliza Partridge had known Joseph since they were seven and ten years old and after their father died they moved in with the Smith family. When Emily was 18, Joseph Smith brought up the idea of polygamy to her and she said, quote, I shut him up so quick that he did not bring the subject up again for several months and my camera died and then my motivation died so this is day two of filming this onward christian soldier we were talking about 18 year old emily partridge being proposed to by 37 year old joseph smith her saying hell no and he didn't talk to her about it for a couple months after that. But that obviously didn't stop him because his tiny microscopic penis wouldn't allow it. So he proposed to her again when she was 19 years old and he sent a woman named Mrs. Durfee to tell her he wanted to meet her at Heber Kimball's house. And Heber Kimball is one of the 12 apostles. And Mrs. Durfee told her that the subject matter was being his wife again, even though she already said no. So she was like, cool, 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 cool. And she booked it. She started running. Literally. She said she was running away and could hear Heber Kimball calling her name until he caught up to her. Which is absolutely terrifying. She is quite literally distancing herself as far away from the situation as possible and she still can't escape it. So she talked to Joseph and consented to marrying him. Around the same time, her sister Eliza was also married to him. And this is what she had to say about marrying Joseph. She said, quote, this was truly a great trial for me, but I had the most implicit confidence in him as a prophet of the Lord and not but believe his word and as a matter of course, accept of the privilege of being sealed to him as a wife for time and all eternity. So by saying it was a trial for her, she admits it was not her idea of a good time, but he was the prophet. This is a huge power imbalance, not to mention completely predatory and unethical. And her father was dead, so he had no say in the matter. So both sisters are married to him, but Emily said, quote, neither of us knew about the other at the time. Everything was so secret. And if you're still not convinced that Emma didn't know about any of this, just get a load of this. When she was finally sort of on board with polygamy, she was allowed to handpick Joseph's wives and guess who she picked? The two sisters that were already married to him. They were already living in her house. She probably thought she could keep an eye on them. So he went to the lengths of staging a mock wedding 
after he was already married to them. He lived a double life quite literally under her nose, but because Emma is a real one, she actually kicked both sisters out of her house shortly after she agreed to let Joseph marry them. I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm guessing it's because she never signed up to be a polygamous wife in the first place and was like, oh yeah, I remembered I actually hate this. Another pair of sisters that Emma handpicked for Joseph were Sarah and Maria Lawrence, who were 16 and 19 years old. Just like the Partridge sisters, they were living in the Smith household at the time because their father had died. And Joseph was actually the legal guardian of these girls, which is so nauseating. I know Emma approved of it, but I do think she was a victim in all of this and was being manipulated by Joseph. I don't think that makes her completely innocent, but I have very mixed feelings about Emma. Abuse thrives in shame and secrecy. Getting these wives to keep quiet was the only way that Joseph Smith was gonna be able to keep doing what he was doing. He also applied the same tactic to church members. On November 7th, 1842, Joseph wrote this in his journal. I charged the saints not to follow the example of the adversary in accusing the brethren and said, if you do not accuse each other, God will not accuse you. If you have no accuser, you will enter heaven. And if you follow the revelations and instructions which God gives you through me, I will take you into heaven as my backload. If you will not accuse me, I will not accuse you. If you throw a cloak of charity over my sins, I will over yours. For charity covereth a multitude of sins. What many people call sin is not sin. I do many things to break down superstition and I will break it down. Even though he may not explicitly be mentioning polygamy, we know he was in the throes of it during this time. It was definitely what he was talking about. To translate, basically, shut up about my polygamous wives and you'll get into heaven. Defend me publicly against the rumors and I won't rake you over the coals. Joseph was a scary person. He had gathered a lot of followers at this point and his ego was the size of Jupiter, so he was very determined to get the things he wanted and wasn't gonna let anyone stand in the way of that. If you were going to rat him out, he would make sure that you would get yours. Another girl who did not want to marry Joseph but was pressured into doing so was Lucy Walker. She was 16 years old. Her mother had passed away, leaving her father with 10 kids to take care of. But Joseph had a great idea. He told the father, hey, you go on a mission, I'll take care of things back home, and I'll adopt your four oldest into my home. And he did. He introduced Lucy as his daughter to people. And then the worst happened. He told her she was supposed to be his wife. She was weirded out, but he told her to pray about it and then come back and talk to him. Lucy said, quote, gross darkness instead of light took possession of my mind. I was tempted and tortured beyond endurance until life was not desirable. Oh, that the grave would kindly receive me, that I might find rest on the bosom of my dear mother. Why should I be chosen from among thy daughters, father? I am only a child in years and experience, no mother to counsel, no father near to tell me what to do in this trying hour. Oh, let this bitter cup pass. And thus I prayed in the agony of my soul. She was a baby, she was a child, and Joseph took advantage of her in every way possible. Joseph spoke to her again and she still was not happy about the proposal. And he said, quote, It is a command of God to you. I will give you until tomorrow to decide this matter. If you reject this message, the gate will be closed forever against you. He's threatening her eternal salvation based upon whether or not she'll marry him. And her parents aren't around to help her or give her advice or tell her to get the hell away from this man. Lucy said, quote, this aroused every drop of scotch in my veins. For a few moments, I stood fearless before him and looked him in the eye. I felt at this moment that I was called to place myself upon the altar, a living sacrifice, perhaps to brook the world in disgrace and incur the displeasure and contempt of my youthful companions. All my dreams of happiness blown to the four winds. <sighs> he literally stole her childhood right out from under her. She goes on to say that after drinking and a sleepless night, she finally received confirmation from God that the eternal principle of polygamy was true. So she consents to being married to him. I've mentioned this before, but there is no consent when a child is being proposed to by a 40 year old man. He abused his power as the prophet and her so-called father in order to get her to trust him and make her believe that what she was doing was commanded of her by God. What she experienced that night is called cognitive dissonance. She knew in her gut it was wrong. She knew she was not wanting to do this. 
it was either that she completely threw away her religion, her belief that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and believed that what he was doing was not of God and that he was a sick, sick guy, or to end her cognitive dissonance, she thought, no, that's, that's just me, that's Satan. I'm the one with the problem. I'm the one who needs to get right with God. Joseph's not doing anything wrong. <sighs> She wanted to unalive herself. There's no consent with what he did. That is not a consensual relationship. The last girl I wanted to talk about was Nancy Rigdon. She was 19 and the daughter of the church leader, Sydney Rigdon. And she is the wife that got away. She escaped Joseph's clutches when she refused to be his wife and his threats didn't really mean anything to her. And he made sure that she paid the price for that. He wrote her what is now known as the happiness letter, which I think should be rebranded to the try not to gouge your eyes out letter. Joseph Smith wrote it to Nancy Rigdon convincing her of the morality and holiness of polygamy after she had rejected his initial proposal. He starts it off by saying, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. Isn't that just all sunshine and rainbows? Until you realize he's talking about getting with young girls. The whole letter is basically a bunch of word salad on how we don't always understand God's commandments. He references how God says thou shalt not kill, but also, you know, sometimes he tells people to kill sometimes, like when he told Nephi to kill Laban in the Book of Mormon. He writes, quote, whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. And I don't think he knows this, but that is the exact point that ex-Mormons and non-religious people make, which is that God is not an unchanging God, as many Christians and especially Mormons believe. They say his doctrine never changes when, quite frankly, it changes all of the time. So I actually agree with Joseph on this one. God is a tricky guy. In this letter, Joseph also mentions Solomon from the Bible, who had like 700 wives, and says that he was sanctioned by God to do so. Even though it seemed abominable, abominable, abominable by those who didn't understand the order of heaven. We'll get into more of Joseph's philosophy on how he rationalizes polygamy in DNC 132, but this letter was written a year before that. He ends his letter in the voice of God, saying things like, listen to the voice of my servant and abide by the laws of my kingdom, which shows how he quite literally thought he spoke for God. I just feel like God has better things to do than convincing a teenager to sleep with you. That's just my gut feeling. Luckily, Nancy saw through his bullshit and and she told her dad everything, which she was not supposed to do. Remember, Joseph told all of his wives to keep it secret. It's just between you, me, and God. And that letter was not supposed to be seen by anyone else's eyes except for Nancy's. So her dad is understandably upset, but Joseph denies everything. And this starts months of a smear campaign against Nancy Rigdon. A man named Joseph Jackson said, quote, with disdain and exposure, he threatened he would set a hundred hellhounds on them to destroy their reputations, and he delivers on this threat. Orson Hyde, one of the Twelve Apostles, calls Nancy a prostitute and says that she just made the whole thing up. She was just upset that Joseph was reprimanding her for being a whore, and she couldn't handle hearing the truth. The rumors are so bad, in fact, that Sidney Rigdon is forced to publicly deny that Joseph Smith ever wrote that letter. And it's only after the Rigdons retract their claims, which we now know to be true. We have this letter. We know Joseph wrote it. It's only after that that Joseph finally called off the dog, so to speak. The last thing I wanted to talk about was Joseph Smith's official declaration of polygamy on July 12th, 1843 in Doctrine and Covenants section 132. He called polygamy the new and everlasting covenant. And by this time, he already had over 30 wives, but one of his wives was still not on board and that was Emma. So according to the church, one morning, his brother Hiram Smith was brainstorming and was like, how can we get Emma on board with this. So he asks Joseph, like, why don't you use the Urim and Thummim, which were some of the seer stones he used to translate the Book of Mormon. He said, why don't you use those to receive revelation from God about polygamy and then Emma will be convinced. And Joseph was like, word, but I don't need the seer stones because it's all right up here. He had already been practicing writing letters and giving speeches to women on how righteous polygamy was that he already knew what to say. And he repeats himself a lot in this declaration. So then he dictates this 
Revelation, which is 66 verses long. You know how parents will say, don't make me use my mom voice or don't make me use my dad voice. I imagine Joseph Smith saying, don't make me use my God voice. That's essentially what this whole scripture is, is he's using the pretense of God to get what he wants out of Emma, which is her consent to continue doing what he's already doing. So in these verses, he talks about the covenant of eternal marriage and that it's the only way you can become gods in the next life. He goes on to talk about plural marriage and how the Old Testament prophets David and Solomon were given wives and concubines from God and they did nothing wrong. Hey, remember in the Book of Mormon when God called David and Solomon abominable for their extramarital activities? So we have God blatantly contradicting himself, which to make clear, this is not God talking. This is Joseph Smith making excuses for stepping out on Emma. But Emma is called out by name saying she is commanded to accept polygamy and she is threatened multiple times if she does not comply. In verse 55, it says if she doesn't accept it that Joseph will get a hundredfold wives, which is ironic considering all the ones he already had. And God continues telling her that Joseph is just going to do it anyway with or without her consent. In verse 61, it states that the wife must give her consent before the man takes another wife. And then four verses later, it says, if she does not consent, that the man can do it anyway and she is the sinner. It says, quote, therefore it shall be lawful in me if she receive not this law for him to receive all things whatsoever I, the Lord is God, will give unto him because she did not believe and administer unto him according to my word and she he then becomes a transgressor, and he is exempt from the law of Sarah, who administered unto Abraham according to the law when I commanded Abraham to take Hagar to wife. So God is contradicting himself again, saying, you need the wife's permission, but you actually don't. And then he misquotes the Bible, saying that Abraham was commanded to take Hagar when Sarah was actually the one that told him to do it because they were infertile and she wanted babies. I mean, it's all right there in Genesis. So either God is a hypocrite and has a bad memory or God didn't write this shit. Joseph did. Other rules that God gave to Joseph in these verses were he needs to only espouse virgins, which we already know Joseph is married to other married women who have children, so he already broke that one. God tells Joseph that if a woman marries multiple men, she is living in adultery, but we know he broke that one as well with his polyandry. And he tells them the purpose for plural wives is to multiply and replenish the earth. Verse 63 says, quote, For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment, for their exaltation in the eternal worlds, that they may bear the souls of men. For herein is the work of my Father continued, that he may be glorified. This is the icing on the cake for me because so many people love to defend Joseph marrying underage women by saying, well, he didn't sleep with them. He didn't sleep with them, which is absolute bullshit. Joseph wrote down that God commanded him to. Although we don't have any proof he had children outside of his marriage with Emma, who's to say that he just wasn't really good at the pull-out method? He didn't want anyone to know he was a polygamist, so it's not outside the realm of possibility to think he was very careful in not getting these women pregnant, or he did have children and threatened them with destruction if they ever told anybody. We also know for sure that future church leaders and prophets had children with underage women. So I don't know why people try to exclude Joseph from that narrative. He's the one who taught them to do that. He is painted as the victim who never wanted polygamy and it was such a trial for him when the whole thing was his freaking idea and he was stoked about it. The happiness letter is proof that Joseph thought polygamy was the bee's knees and the key to temporary and eternal happiness. But like I said, Joseph was still denying this publicly saying, quote, I had not been married scarcely five minutes and made a proclamation of the gospel before it was reported that I had seven wives. I mean to live and proclaim the truth as long as I can. A man asked me whether the commandment was given that a man may have seven wives, and now the new prophet has charged me with adultery. I never had any fuss with these men until that female relief society brought out the paper against adulterers and adulteresses. I am innocent of all these charges, and you can bear witness of my innocence, for you know me yourselves. What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. I am the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago and I can prove them all perjurers. The confidence and lack of guile in this man I know this word is used a lot, but he truly was sociopathic. I think it's interesting that he talks shit about the Female Relief Society when it's an organization within the church and he blames them for these rumors spreading, 
But guess who was a part of the Relief Society? His wife, Emma. Published in the church newspaper in October 1842, we, the undersigned members of the Ladies Relief Society and married females, do certify and declare that we know of no system of marriage being practiced in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, save the one contained in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. This was signed by Emma and three of her counselors, all who were secretly married to Joseph. He's so embarrassing. Joseph Smith's own brother, William, was practicing something called spiritual wifery, which is an appetizer to polygamy. It meant he was having sex with unmarried women and telling them it wasn't a sin. And it was totally fine because Joseph told him to do it. So William propositions this girl, Catherine Fuller, and she's like, um, no thank you. This is not in line with the church's teachings. And she testified that William said, quote, Joseph was obliged to teach the contrary on the stand to keep down prejudice and keep peace at home. A man named Chauncey Higby propositioned a girl named Nancy in the same manner, and she testified, quote, he proposed that I should yield to his desires and indulge in intercourse with him, stating that such intercourse might be freely indulged in and was no sin, that any respectable female might indulge in intercourse and there was no sin in it, providing the person so indulging keep the same to herself, for there could be no sin where there was no accuser, and most clandestinely with wicked lies persuaded me to yield by using the name of Joseph Smith. Remember that quote I said about Joseph saying, where there is no accuser, there is no sin? And obviously you can sleep with whoever you want as long as you have consent. The issue is Joseph was practicing this in private and preaching something entirely different over the pulpit. Basically, he gets to follow different rules than his members, and we see that a lot in church history. So the repercussions of Joseph Smith's polygamy would affect generations of Mormons, with the next six prophets after him being practicing polygamists, the last being Heber J. Grant, who was the prophet until 1945. This was not that long ago. In 1857, Apostle Heber C. Kimball really loved being a polygamist saying, quote, in the spirit world, there is an increase of males and females. There are millions of them. And if I am faithful all the time and continue right with Brother Brigham, we will go to Brother Joseph and say, here we are, Brother Joseph. We are here ourselves, are we not, with none of the property we possessed in our probationary state, not even the rings on our fingers. He will say to us, come along, my boys. We will give you a good suit of clothes. Where are your wives? They are back yonder. They would not follow us. Never mind, says Joseph. Here are thousands. Have all you want. I can't wait to be one of his wives. To this day, the church practices polygamy in the temple, allowing men to be sealed to multiple women, but women are not allowed to be sealed to multiple men. To be clear, the Mormon church fully believes that polygamy will be practiced in the next life. President Russell M. Nelson is sealed to two women, as well as Dallin H. Oaks. Joseph Smith did not call polygamy the new and everlasting covenant because he thought it was going to be a temporary thing. And I'm not trying to be funny when I say this. I genuinely believe he would have loved the FLDS church. They are just following his teachings. If you can name one difference between Warren Jeffs and Joseph Smith to me, nothing will happen because there is no difference between them. Both claim to be a prophet, both marrying underage girls, both committing crimes because they think God told them that they could. Jokingly, I can say Joseph Smith just couldn't keep it in his pants, but in all seriousness, he was a predator, he was a schmetophile, and he abused his power to prey upon the vulnerable members of the church. It's really messed up that I wasn't taught the true nature of polygamy growing up. I testified that I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet so many times on the pulpit, not knowing any of this stuff for good reason. The church doesn't want you to know these things. And the arguments against polygamy just don't hold up. There was no rhyme or reason for it. It was just, God said so, God said so, God said so. I don't think the people that need to watch this are necessarily going to be the ones to watch this. And I get that I'm mixing facts with my opinions, but all of my sources will be down below. If you'd like to fight me in the comments about this, please do. It boosts my video and I would be ever so grateful. Thank you for watching. I'm gonna make more videos about Joseph Smith, church history, weird Mormon things, basically whatever I want to, whatever's on my mind at the time. I am pretty close to getting the amount of subscribers I need to get this channel monetized. Even though that wasn't my goal for this channel, it would be nice to have a camera that didn't shut off every 30 minutes while I'm recording. So if you guys wanna hit that subscribe button, comment your nice and unkind thoughts, and send it to your mom, send it to your Mormon friends. Take care of yourself, bye.